So we're going to talk about forages and feedstuffs. And the first thing that we're going to talk about with forages is that they need to be the bulk of the diet because a horse is a fiber digester. This is where they get the most of their energy and most of their nutrients from being broken down in that cecum of the fiber in the forage. Forages come in different shapes. We have fresh grass or legumes that are fresh and then we have hay that can be made of grass or legumes as well. The forages provide a lot of fiber in the diet as we've talked about before and this is where the horse gets a lot of their energy after it is broken down in the hindgut by the bacteria. It also provides carbohydrates in the form of the leaves of the hay and the fresh grasses. And those are broken down in the stomach and absorbed into the small intestine as a readily available energy source. And then there are proteins in the forages as well, specifically the amino acids that are going to build the prote proteins in the horse. Proteins are higher in the legumes rather than the fresh hays or grasses, but there's still a significant amount of protein in forage for the horse. So there are different ways to feed a forage to a horse. We can have fresh, obviously from pasture, where they can just go out and graze as much or as little as you allow. Then we have different types of preservation methods for forages. We have uh, cubes and silage and haylage. Preserved forages can come in different shapes and sizes. We have preserved ground, which is like haylage and silage. We have cubes or pellets which are preserved and then put into different shapes. There are different byproducts that come from processing the forages and then just basic preserved which would be just your sun cured hay that has been out in the pasture. So fresh forage obviously comes in the form of the pasture whatever it is still growing at this point. Uh, grass, we have lots of different grasses. We have cool season versus warm season grasses. Up here in Wyoming, we generally grow cool season grasses simply because our growing season is short and the temperatures are a lot less than those in the south. Now in the south, they grow a lot of warm season grasses and those typically have a longer growing season and they can withstand higher heats for longer periods of time. Now a cool season grass would be like a timothy, fescue, brome, warm season grass. The most notable is your Bermuda grass. Legumes are soybeans, alfalfa, and your clovers. Again, they are nitrogen fixing. They take the nitrogen out of the air and put it in the ground. So they have a high amount of protein, which uh, includes nitrogen in them. So fresh forage would be pasture, obviously, that again, you can have them eat as much or as little as they want. Green chop is the same as if you would go mow your lawn and what comes out of the bag that you have just cut, the clippings in the bag, if you went out and dumped that in your horse pasture, that's called green chop. Now that is a very excellent feed for your horse. However, there are some risks with that. It is very high in carbohydrates or starches, so it's easy to founder a horse on green chop. But the other thing that you have to worry about too is that green chop is so moist that if you don't spread it out very well, it can mold and mold quickly and the mold will cause multiple issues within your horse's body. So preserved forages, we're going to start with hay. Hay is just cutting it out in the field, sun curing it for a few days, and then baling it up and feeding it later. Silage or haylage is where it is cut in the field, chopped up, placed in a place, it could be a pit, it could be a silage, uh, silo, and these are left to ferment without oxygen. So the top layer is usually generally pretty moldy and whatnot because there's oxygen there, but once you get down into the meat of the haylage or silage there is no air and so there's no mold or mildew growing there because it is anaerobic. It also has kind of a sweet stench to it where there is a lot of acid in it. Meals are ground up forages into powders or whatnot and then they are pelleted or cubed. 
and then you have pellets or cubes as well. So hay again can be made of grass and or legumes. Uh, a lot of people do a lot of alfalfa grass mixes. The best time to cut your hay is what's called the boot stage. If you see in the photo here, this is before the seed head ap appears. And this is when your hay is at its maximum nutritional value with the maximum amount of leaf and stem. Now, if you let it go beyond the boot stage to the heading stage, then your plant is starting to preserve itself uh, or ready itself for the dormant stage, which means all of the nutrition of that plant is being put into the head or the seed ready for the next generation of plants. Therefore, your plant is going to have a way higher ratio of stem to leaf. So you're going to eventually just be feeding more structural carbohydrates or cellulose than you are non-structural or starch. Now if you cut and bale your hay at the boot stage, then you have a good ratio of both starches and cellulose, giving your horse a high quality feed. Again, all those vitamins and minerals and the protein will all be in the leaf and the stem still, as it has not been stored in the seed head. A few things that we do need to be aware of when we are cutting and curing our hay is that in Colorado South, there is the chance of having blister beetles in your alfalfa. But what happens is, is they like to nest in alfalfa fields and they will eat the alfalfa. And if you cut your alfalfa and use a conditioner on your swather, then you have the opportunity to basically crush those beetles into the hay, killing them and leaving them with it. Now blister beetles are nasty little creatures. What happens is blister beetles carry a toxin called cantharidin in their systems. It is in t throughout their entire body. The shells, the guts, everything of the beetle contains cantharidin. And this literally causes your horse to blister. Uh, this blister is very painful, obviously like any blister that we would get, but it would be on their insides. So from the lips all the way back through the anus, your horse can be blistered from the toxin cantharidin. Even if the bl blister beetles are killed, the cantharidin is still active. So it is most dangerous to cut and bale hay that has gone through a conditioner uh, alfalfa out of these areas because those the conditioner will kill the beetles and leave them in there and then your hay is full of the toxins. Cattle are not injured by the cantharidin in the blister beetles. They can eat them and they are not bothered. Blister beetles are most prevalent in the second or third cuttings of your hay so it is best to have your first cutting for your horses and leave your second and third cutting alfalfa for the cattle or other ruminants who don't seem to be as affected by the cantharidin as horses. Now another problem that you would have to worry about in cutting and curing hay is mold. If your hay gets rained on or if it gets baled too wet then you have to worry about mold getting into your hay Mold, as we've talked about, can do several different things from preventing the uptake of nutrients to causing respiratory disease in your horses. So mold is definitely an issue you want to try and alleviate. And when you're baling your hay, you want to do it with a little bit of moisture in it simply because you don't want to lose all those leaves where all the nutrition are. However, again, you don't want it to be too wet because you run the risk of mold. <clears throat> storing hay, you need to try and store it if possible out of the sunlight and out of the weather because weather and sunlight will leach the vitamins out of their hay. If any of you have ever seen yellowed hay in a hay stack, all of that yellow hay has been leached of the vitamin A and vitamin E in it and the green stuff in the middle is what keeps the vitamins. So if possible to make your hay a much better forage for your horse, it is best to store it out of the sunlight and out of the weather. Now, storing it for long periods of time 
is also your enemy as time will allow the breakdown of those vitamins in your hay as well. So silage or haylage uses anaerobic fermentation as we said before. You can put it in a silo, a pit, or as you can see sealed plastic bags. Anaerobic means without oxygen and this is where it is fermented into an easily digestible feed. Now the one thing you do have to worry about with silage or haylage is a nasty little bacterium called botulism and this can cause several problems in your horses one of which is death so if you do feed haylage or silage it would be a good idea to vaccinate your horses for botulism. So a meal is made up of grass or, and or legumes and they are ground down into a very fine powder and then they are usually put in with other ingredients to make your commercial feeds. As you can see here this is a pile of alfalfa meal. Then that meal can be used to be put into pellets just like you see here and it has very little water count content in pellets and meals and cube. So that is something that you really need to keep an eye on for when you are feeding your horses. The pros and the cons of feeding pellets and or cubes? Well, they're easy to store. If you don't have a lot of room to stack a bunch of hay bales or anything like that, or maybe you don't have the money to buy several ton of hay all at once, you can go down to the feed store and get two or three bags of pellets or cubes put them in a feed barrel, something that's dry and is dark, and you can feed that. You don't have to worry about them being in there for too long and that time will leach out your vitamins because it generally will feed them fairly quickly. The cons to feeding pellets or cubes are that they are dehydrated a lot. They're about 95% dry matter. What this means for you as a horse owner is that when you feed these, your horse always has a little bit of water and the acids in his stomach, which is a liquid. So once these pellets and or cubes hit the stomach, then they soak all that liquid up and then they expand. Well, once that expansion starts, that can cause a problem with impaction colic. Uh, if they start to expand even in the throat because the horse is producing a lot of saliva, this can cause choke. So they can be very dangerous to feed if you do not soak them first. Now with pellets, because they are so compact and dehydrated, it generally takes about 30 to 40 minutes to get the pellets really good and wet down so you are alleviating the risk of colic or choke. Cubes are fairly compact too, only they are bigger chunks. They are still very dehydrated. This is most often alfalfa. Because again, the water content is so low in these, they do expand. Now because they are bigger chunks and have a little bit more air in them, it doesn't take nearly as long to wet them down to a sufficient level so that your horse does not have the risk of choke or colic. It generally takes 15 to 20 minutes to wet down the alfalfa cubes. Again, as with the pellets, the pros would be they're easy to store, generally readily available just go pick them up from the store and feed it out or if you're going on a trip you can pick up a bag of these and it's easy to pack and you would have two or three days worth you don't have to worry about putting a big bale of hay in your trailer so our cereal grains are next and they consist of corn oats rice wheat barley and milo and as you can see here from the diagram we have a bit of anatomy of the grain we have the hull which is made up of mostly fiber and it's generally hard and as we know in the horse's digestive tract breaking down fiber has to happen in the cecum or the large colon in the hindgut. Well if this hole is not broken or is left whole then in order to get the energy from the middle which are the carbohydrates, the proteins and the vitamins in there it has to go through the hindgut first in order to break down the fibrous hole and then get to the stuff in the inside. Now we know from our digestive anatomy that most of our vitamins and minerals and non-structural carbohydrates are absorbed in the small intestine which is before the cecum and the large colon. Therefore when using cereal grains in your feeds it is best to get cracked, cracked 
crushed or rolled grains that are easily broken down in the stomach and then the insides, the carbohydrates, the vitamins, the minerals are all able to be absorbed into the small intestine giving you the more bang for your buck for nutrition and then once that broken fiber is gone into the hindgut it also can be broken down by the bacteria and your horse gets the nutrition out of it. So we're going to go through the cereal grains individually now and give you a little bit of their characteristics. So corn is highly palatable. Horses really like it. It is also very energy dense. The hull on a corn is very thin and most of the grain itself is non-structural carbohydrate or starch. So it's low in fiber because that hull is very thin and it is lower in calcium and most of the vitamins. Because it is very energy dense with the non-structural carbohydrates or starches, it is very easy to founder your horse feeding grain. Corn. Okay, corn would be broken down into the stomach, absorbed into the small intestine, and what is not absorbed there goes on to the cecum where it is fermented rapidly, producing lactic acid, which then through gravity flows down through the feet to the feet and causes the inflammation of the lamina and insensitive lamina in the horse's feet, which then spread, do not hold nearly as well. It is very painful for the horse and can cause rotation of the coffin bone if left gone to go too far. Now corn has a few problems. It is very, very susceptible to mold. It needs to be kept in a cool, dry place and out of sunlight and heat because the mold in it will just take over in a matter of days. So oats are the most palatable of all of the cereal grains. Horses love oats. It does have a thicker hull on it, giving it a higher fiber content than corn does have a little less energy than corn because it does have a thicker hull, which means less starch in the middle. It's very high cost. Now with oats, as we've talked about, you need to crush, crimp, or roll them in order to break that hull open in order for the horse to utilize the starch on the inside before it gets to the hindgut. Oats are also very pr uh, prone to mycotoxins and mycotoxins get into the horse's blood and cause all sorts of different problems. Barley is mid-level fiber. It does have a hull on it, although not as much as the oat. It has energy in between corn and oats. It's got a little bit smaller grain head there. It is less palatable than oats or corn, so horses might have a little more trouble eating it. This is one of those grains that you probably would have to feed with a little bit of molasses. Milo is a small hard kernel that has to be steam flaked in order for that hull to be broken for your horse to get to the nutrients in the middle. It is a very hard kernel that even their digestive system in the hindgut has a hard time getting to the nutrients in the inside. So if you steam flake it, that'll break down that hull enough to where your horse can make use of the nutrients in the middle. This is the least palatable of all the grains. Horses really don't like it. It is also the least digestible because of the high fiber content in the hull and hard to get to. Um, Milo can only be fed as grain and the reason for that is that the leaves of the plant contain cyanide and they can and will kill your horse. So wheat is the most expensive of all of the cereal grains simply because most of the wheat in the world is grown for human consumption. They're very hard kernels. They're very high in energy, about two and a half times more than corn. Okay, so that's very, very high energy. They're low in fiber, but they're not very palatable to a horse. They don't really like it as well as oats or corn, which is probably a good thing because it'll save you some money, uh, being how it is very expensive. With wheat, you have to crack, grind, or steam it in order to use it for feeds because that hull is very high are very hard um, and if you feed a lot of wheat you run the risk of giving your horse diarrhea colic and flounder again because there is a lot of energy in those kernels once you get to the inside it is all that starch and two and a half times more energy than corn and you do run the risk of foundering your horse rice is generally not used in livestock feeds although um, overseas it is some because they grow so much of it has a very, very thick fibrous hull. Um, it's sharp, so horses really don't want to eat it unless it has been hulled. 
Um, that hull though is very high in fiber and the grain itself has the same energy as corn. Um, it doesn't have very much protein in it, just the energy and the fiber, which would make it good for just keeping your horse warm in the winter time. Beet pulp is an additive um, as a sup or a supplement. So, um, for instance, Triple Crown Senior Horse Feed adds beet pulp into it to give the high fiber content of that feed, or you can simply supplement your horse with beet pulp to keep the guts moving and give him a little extra energy during the winter time. It is a mid-level protein and it does have more calcium than phosphorus in it, which makes it a really good feed to add in the winter time. So hulls are basically a byproduct and they're used as a feed additive. You have soy, wheat, and oat hulls. They're very high in fiber, low in starch because the grain has been pulled out. Um, they're high in calcium, low in phosphorus, and this makes once they've been hulled, they're very palatable because they're broken apart, but it does make for a good additive when you need to add fiber into your 